Thanks for tuning in to the Drive On Podcast, where we are focused on giving hope and strength to the entire military community. Whether you're a veteran, active duty, guard, reserve, or a family member, this podcast will share inspirational stories and resources that are useful to you. I'm your host, Scott Lucio, and now let's get on with the show. When things go sideways, will you be prepared? Some people are concerned they might have to go for a long time without electricity or even food. That's why I want to introduce you to 4Patriots.com. Get preparedness products you can use now and that could save your life later. My favorite is 4Patriots' new solar generator, the Patriot Power Generator 2000X. It uses the endless free power of the sun to power lights, your TV, medical equipment, even run your fridge. Plus, it's expandable and comes with a free solar panel. Or pick up one of 4Patriots' best-selling survival food kits. Delicious tasting and designed to last for 25 years. They even have kits with real meat. And if the power's out, no worries. Just boil water over a fire, simmer, and serve. You'll enjoy a hot meal and stay safe in a crisis. More smart people than ever are finding 4Patriots. Over 2 million customers trust them. And you might have even seen them on TV. I had the folks at 4Patriots set up a special page for you at 4 Patriots dot com forward slash drive on so that listeners of this podcast can see this week's discounts and deals before they go away go to fourpatriots.com forward slash drive on but hurry these deals won't last long save more and get peace of mind now by going to fourpatriots.com forward slash drive on hey everybody welcome back to drive on i'm your host scott deluzio today my guest is donald dunn donald is an army veteran who runs a nonprofit called heroes voices media foundation and they work with veterans who are musicians, podcasters, and authors to promote their work and help with training in their field. Uh, we're going to talk a little more about that in just a minute. But first, welcome to the show, Donald. Um, I'm glad to have you here. Hey, I'm glad to be here, man. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, you bet. Um, for the listeners who aren't familiar with you and in the stuff that you do, um, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? So I went in the military straight out of the uh High school, you know, 1994, I decided, you know, high school's over. Let's just change everything. So I got married and went straight in the army and uh, spent 20 years in the military. I did uh, 68 months between uh, Bosnia, Iraq, and Afghanistan. I did 10 years in the special ops community. So I kind of seen a little bit of all sorts of different sides, sides of the military. Um, you know, no different than probably any other soldier. Every every reenlistment, I said, I'm getting out. I'm done with this. And then it was I, Donald Dunn, you solemnly swear <laughs> to uphold and, and, you know. So um, I think that's pretty common for, for everybody. Yeah. And uh, I, uh, for different reasons, whatever, I found myself in the desire to, to reenlist. And, and uh, I can't regret a minute of it because... Uh, you know, that path is what has led me to where I am sitting in this chair today. So I think it's a, a awesome adventure with the ups and downs and, and everything else that came with it. Yeah. And I think everybody has those ups and downs in their military service where, you know, they one day they're they're reenlisting and they're all, you know, gung ho about it. And they they they're all about it. And the next day they're oh. like, what the hell yep. did I do? Right. <laughs> So, you know, uh, and those ups and downs, I think it just comes with the territory. And we have these things that um, that we get through, but they, like you said, they make us who we are. And it's the reason why you're doing what you do, you're doing today. And the reason why you're sitting here talking with me today to uh, get the word out about uh, the, the work that you do. So um, I'd love to hear a little bit about your 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 time in the military as far as um you know the deployments anything in interesting that stands out anything like that that uh that you might want to uh kind of show so, you know i came in at an interesting time um and and i say that because 94 is is when i actually came in and there was nothing really going on you know the the gulf war was over with and uh the amount of people that actually experienced that was still kind of slim in you know it wasn't like it is now where if you didn't have a combat patch you're like where have you been right you know but uh back in those times you know when you did 
find some old crusty E5 or something that that had a combat patch, he was kind of like, ooh, you know, yeah, and and everyone talked to him about it, and so I came in because I was looking for a job. I had gotten married, and you know, I was right out of high school and didn't have the grades for college or the money, and I uh, didn't really have the maturity either, and so I decided you know go in the military and uh me and my wife started our our life at that point you know so we uh my first duty station was korea and uh you know the funny part about that I, and i always kind of laugh because it's crazy how life puts these little you know weird anomalies on you and you're like how the hell did that happen but uh so my wife i met in seventh grade and uh, we dated all through junior high and high school and then got married her mom is Korean and her dad is American. And uh, my first duty station was Korea. And I happened to got stationed in her mom's hometown. Oh, wow. Well, I have met family members of hers that she has never met. <laughs> right. Uh, my wife has never been to Korea. I speak more Korean than my wife does. And so, you know, it's, it's you know, really really kind of funny in the, in that aspect, but it was cool that I got to see some of her, her culture and, and everything, but it was not how I wanted to start the career. You know, sure. I didn't want to be away from family right out the get go for a year when everything is now new. We didn't know anything about the benefits and how to do this and how to do that. And so when I thought it couldn't get any worse, I got my orders and they sent me to Fort bliss <laughs> and, uh, I found out that it can be worse in the States than Korea. So, <laughs> you know, I was a private and, and we were struggling just to make ends meet. And, uh, you know, my wife couldn't even get a job at McDonald's cause she didn't speak Spanish. So it was, it was brutal in, in that aspects. And, uh, I was like, I'm getting out I'm, we're done with this, but I hated it so much that if I wanted to get out, I had to stay there like another 18 months. Or I could just re-enlist to leave. And I was like, well, I don't hate the army that much. <laughs> Let's, I, so I re-enlist. Out. So I, you know, I kind of credit uh, Fort Bliss for, for getting me to my retirement. Because I was, I was bent about getting out. And I was still immature as hell. <laughs> and so um, I think I would have gotten out had, had my ETS date been a little bit closer. Sure. But uh, um. So I went to Germany from there is where we went. And that's where I got to experience my first deployment. So, you know, now I'm thinking, you know, and I'm talking to some of these Gulf War veterans, you know, and they're telling me what, what they experienced. So I'm picturing the world to be like that. And it's nothing like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I kind of, you know, in the book that I wrote, um, for my kids, I, uh, I kind of, credit that bosnia was kind of like a a false sense of security i guess because there was not much going on in bosnia it was a peacekeeping mission and and the worst thing that you had to watch out for was you know landmines and stuff like that that had, had been eroded and the rain had washed down into your roadways and you know kids right. you know kids trying to be uh helpful but they would like pick up live ordnance and grenades and stuff and try to bring them to you and versus trying to come and get you take you to them right you know so we had a few of those scares where you know we, we've had some young kids bring you know live grenades to the to the gate or like yelling for them to stop and you know but for the most part it did not prepare you for what was coming after you know 9 11 yeah and so i kind of tell everybody you know that was that was kind of like a a false sense of training because that was my only experience up to that point. And then I got an opportunity that I just, I find amazing because that was the best, this, this next part is the best 10 years of my military career. Um, I volunteered to go into the 160th, um, the 160th SOARS, a special operations aviation regiment. And, uh, you know, we kind of all joke and we say, you know, we're, we are the Uber for the special ops community. Um, I got to work with some really cool, you know, guys and, and organizations and meet some really cool people. And, uh, it changes the military changes. You know, when, when you're in a unit where 
yeah. yeah, everybody volunteered to be in the army, but when you have to volunteer to put yourself through hell, knowing that there's a chance you won't even get selected and you may get sent off somewhere else, um, and then you make it, and what's left is left in that unit, it, it's a whole different level of you know, the big boy program, everybody now wants to be there. Yeah. And, you know, I, I still laugh because when I was, when I got there and I hadn't been through selection yet, they put you in what's called a holding platoon because everything's classified. So you're not allowed to go in any of the buildings or work with any of the people. And I got put on this detail and the, the person that I'm working with had, was just in his brown t-shirt. He didn't have his top on. We're loading these flight pallets to be sent out for uh missions yeah, that dude was a master sergeant it was just me and him you know and that's the way that whole unit was it didn't matter your rank everybody was first name thesis right and i didn't know he was in the eight till he put his top on because he introduced me by his first name <laughs> and i love i mean i absolutely loved it it was the be- it was literally the best 10 years of my life and uh you know, the, the downfall to that was that was the unit I was in when nine eleven happened. And so, you know, some people on the outside, they, they look at that and they say, man, you were so lucky. You only had to do three or four months or five months or whatever on your deployments. And, and what they didn't realize was we were a battalion asset that was in Iraq, Afghanistan, the United States, Colombia. Philippines, Korea, all at the same time. We had five, five theaters that we were supporting. And we were so thin that they ended up activating the, the Iowa National Guard to come and run um, our day-to-day activities in the United States. There at some in Savannah because uh-huh. we didn't have the people. So, you know, we would go to, like, I didn't speak Spanish, so I never went to the Columbia missions. Um, and it was mostly crew chiefs and stuff that went to the Philippine side. But I I would do three months in Iraq, three months in Afghanistan, three months in Iraq, you know. And it was just back and forth. And when you were in the states, you were supporting the seventy fifth or, you know, special forces or anybody else that was doing, you know, stateside training. So you were you were still literally no you're never home. Right. And uh, you know, I my wife was just like in awe because when she went to my support groups. You know, and and the wives there introduce themselves. They they told her, you know, we need to start handing out in the welcome packets for all the wives dildos because you're never going to see your husband. <laughs> and we were we were on the road so much. I was t- either TDY or deployed, probably, you know, two hundred and some odd days out of the year. And so, even though I still loved it, it was hard on the family. And uh, and I think the those, reason why. I wanted to kind of hear a little bit about this side of it is because a lot of people who might be listening to this, I mean, obviously there's, there's some veterans and service members and stuff who listen to this, but, uh, um, there's other people too, who listen to it, who just aren't interested in stories like this. Um, just letting people know, like, it's, it's not all, um, you know, Oh, a three, four month deployment. Oh, okay, great. Uh, and, and then you get, to come home and you get to, you know, have cookouts in the backyard and barbecues and birthday parties and all that stuff. No, you're still doing other stuff or yeah. you're going someplace else. Um, you know, while that one deployment might have been three or four months, the next one's going to be three or four months too. And um, there's only so yeah. many months in a year. So, you know, where are you going to put all that time? The other, the other thing people don't, don't understand, you know, in order for you to get dwell time, you have to do at least nine months. So, you know, for you to be exempt from deployment, when you come back, um, or go to your next duty station, you you know, dwell time is what we call the, okay, I deployed for nine months. So you can't deploy me for a year or whatever their policy is. Well, when you're doing three months there and then three months back home, three months that you don't get dwell time because you've never accumulated nine consecutive months. Hmm. And uh, so it does become hard because you don't get that break. And then when tragedy happens, you really don't get that break. Right. And, and that's when, you know, um, that was one of the things that, that, you know, I kind of went through 
that bothered me because you know when we had uh when we lost some some of our friends and our our buddies we went straight from getting the news to eight hours later starting to practice funeral detail waiting for the bodies to get back from afghanistan and you know i had only been back from afghanistan now for a couple weeks and now we're doing funeral details and as that whole process goes along you know it is now focused on the ceremony and and the logistics of where we're going to be you know we, we're talking we were doing funerals for um up, potentially up to eight people that we had eight um that was killed at the same time and so if they if they if the families did not choose for arlington then we were performing the funerals right and so you know i performed three of them myself and uh then shortly after the funerals was over, it was my turn to play again. So it, it's, you know, you're, there's no grieving time or there's no opportunity to really digest it. You go straight from that to, and now I'm going to start getting prepared mentally and physically for the deployments. Oh, and now, by the way, reality has just sat in and I've watched family members now packing their stuff up because they have to move because they're, source of income is now gone and it becomes your, your outlook becomes different your your mentality of when you're deploying now thinks now you're thinking shit that could be my family yeah you yeah. know and so it changes a lot of things but you don't get to that time to digest it and and understand it because the tempo is just insanely moving and so you're constantly you're on to the next thing before the thing that's going on is even really over. And so you're constantly going, 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 going. Now, I got to imagine at some point, like when you got transitioned out of the military, when you got out, uh, did all that, did all that stuff kind of catch up to you at that point? Was it, was it kind of like, just like this big snowball rolling down the hill, getting bigger, 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 bigger. And then all of a sudden it just stops and it crashes into something. And, uh, so, or, or how did that look for you? Yeah. So a absolutely. So, you know, I, that was where I kind of wrote this book for my, my family, because, you know, I was that guy that loved to joke around and laugh and, and be the center. I was the comedian. And, uh, as the deployments happened, that just slowly changed. Yeah. And, uh, I slowly started pushing my family away. And by this time, my kids are now getting in that puberty teenage years to where they're observant and understanding of what's going around and they kind of were still young enough to where they remember what their dad was like when they were little but now dad's not that way mm -hmm. but dad doesn't see that dad doesn't even see that he's changed you know and uh when your whole home front changes but then you go to work and you can't tell anybody that things are not good at home because you don't want to tell them that, that you're fucked up be from the um the uh um war because then that's going to affect your career okay. you know nobody wants nobody wants to admit that you're broke and and be different from uh the next soldier mm -hmm. and it you know we've all especially as leaders we've seen how some of these soldiers can get isolated you know if they if the chain of command doesn't validate your reasoning for having problems. Right. And so I never said nothing. I never told my wife, you know, I would lie about it. You know, for two years, my wife didn't even sleep in the same bed with me because she got tired of getting elbowed and punched and me yelling and, yeah. and stuff like that. She would ask me what I was dreaming about. And I would tell her, I don't remember, you know, mm -hmm. I, didn't, I knew what they were, but I didn't want to share that stuff and bring that stuff from there to here. Mm -hmm. And I, I was doing them a favor. But the reality was I was just bottle capping it. You know, I was just pushing it down, pushing it down. And, uh, at the same time, you know, I've, I've, I've been going through some group therapy and, and I've really gotten down, you know, I've gotten this last year, I've gotten a lot of good work in as far as being able to kind of pinpoint problems, you know, mm -hmm. and I really hate myself, you know, I felt I didn't really want to deploy anymore. Um, because I, I was afraid of losing my family and losing myself, you know, I was kind of disgraced with myself because I was getting to that point where I was like, you know, I felt like I did my time 
why can't it be somebody else's turn? <laughs> you know, right. The only where I got retirement, the more nervous and scared that I was. So, you know, and this went all the way up to retirement. When I left uh, the 160th, I retired out of Fort Stewart. And I, uh, um, I ended up uh, going on another deployment with them to uh, Ramadi, you know, and I didn't, I didn't want to do that either. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I was supposed to go to Al-Assad and that's kind of what I was telling myself, look, Al-Assad's, you know, a cakewalk compared to Afghanistan. Sure. And uh, then I get there and I don't know you're going to take five guys and you're going to go to Ramadi and you're going to be the guy in charge of setting up the maintenance program there. And oh, by the way, you're going to drive to Fallujah three times a week and, and you're going to be training Iraqis and logistics there, you know? So now, you know, now my life is being put in convoys repeatedly and, and everything else. And, you know, it just helped push me down into that deeper, dark hole. Right. And, uh, you know, by the time I got over, I, I had hated myself so much that I didn't even want to live anymore. You know, so, you know, m mentally I was, you know, not, you know, subconsciously I didn't want to die, but mentally I didn't want to live either. And so, you know, that affected my family. And when I would come back, I would literally walk in the house, sit down, eat dinner with the family, and then I would get up and go to the bedroom. And I stayed there until the next day. It was the only place I felt normal. Mm hmm you know, and I had completely isolated my whole family. And when I retired, I did the worst thing. I couldn't find a job. Um, and, uh, I was so depressed and, and internally focused internally on myself that, uh, about how bad things were, you know, that I couldn't even help myself make the best decision. So, you know, I started a company and I, and I, I found a job for myself by creating and I started a trucking company. And so I bought a semi truck and I put myself in a truck driving 11 hours a day, sleeping in a truck by myself, six weeks out of the time and only home for a week, which just helped me isolate myself and helped me push myself further away from my family. And in 11 hours of driving, trust me, you can get in your head a lot. Right. That's a lot. That's a lot of time alone with your thoughts. And that could be, that could be scary depending on what kind of thoughts you might be having. And in this case, uh, it seems like and they weren't the best, right? No, they absolutely not. And, and so, you know, this is, believe it or not, that's actually really normal. You know, when you, when you start looking at what soldiers do, they, they end up, a lot of them move out and end up becoming truck drivers. And, and it's because they don't want to be around people. Right. It's a, it's a job where they can be by themselves and not have to deal with people. And, uh, it's just, it's, they don't even realize it, but that's just another symptom of PTSD. Yeah. You know, the isolation and, uh, the, the part that, that was really bad about this is, you know, this is shortly before, you know, I only held the company for six years before I shut it down and I hadn't gotten any help. You know, I was so angry at the world that you know i still remember as i was out processing i told the the guy at the va uh, i stopped and asked him a question the day before my appointment to go fill out all my medical records and and start my you know been a va benefits and he was it was before his day started he was standing out in the hallway talking joking around with another soldier that he knew and he was a civilian and and i stopped to ask him what paperwork I was going to have to bring for tomorrow. And they had like set days that were walk-ins and then they had set days that were appointments. Mm -hmm. And when I walked up to him, I said, Hey, excuse me, sir. I said, I got a question for you. And, uh, he said, uh, do you got an appointment? And I said, no, I just have a question. I said, my appointment's tomorrow. And he said, well, we don't accept walk-ins today. And he turned around and walked off <laughs> and it set me off like that, you know? I started screaming at him. I told him to go F off. I didn't need his F and money. You know, I didn't yeah. file a VA three years. Wow. Yeah. So I was hell bent on to hell with you. I don't need you when I really did. Mm -hmm. These were all 
these were all not normal reactions, but it was the only emotion I had, you know, 68 months of deployments. And the only emotion you get to deal with stuff is anger, you know? And so that's what came out for everything. It didn't matter anything as simple as that, you know, I, a normal guy could have just said, well, whatever, and just walk in the next day and not know whether he had all this paperwork or not. Right. But not me. I didn't even cancel my appointment. I just didn't show up, you know? Yeah. And this, this was me being an ass and uh, not thinking straight. And, and that same attitude also brushed off on my kids, my family, you know? Um, and it all came to a boiling point. Um, you add in, the and, and it's no excuse, but when you you put yourself in a isolation stuff and and then you start listening to media and and that whole politics came around about you know you had the Trump sides and you had the, the other sides and then you had the, the 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 vaccine COVID guys and the non-vaccine COVID guys and and I'm already in my head not even mentally stable and now here I'm absorbing all this stuff too and it's putting me in a, a place that I am not, I mean, it was having me do things that I am not, that's not me. Yeah. You know, I had a that uh, reached out to me and me and him got into a huge argument over, over politics. And, uh, um, you know, I ended up abandoning him and not even talking to him anywhere. And that, that is not me that I'm not that guy. Right. You know, and uh, it all goes back to, the fact that I hadn't seeked help and this was now, you know, you think of it as like a, a thermometer. Well, now that, you know, everything has gotten to that top and it's about ready to come out and it did. And it came out on my son and, and it, you know, I tell people this was like the worst day of my life, but yet it also was the beginning of the best day. And, uh, I went back home for a hurricane that came through and I, I got there before the hurricane. And, uh, most people in Georgia live in trailers. So, you know, my son, his girlfriend, her mom, her, her, her my, his girlfriend's sister, their kids, my kids, my grandkids, my wife, my cousin, my brother, everybody's in my house batting down for this hurricane. I can't leave. I can't go nowhere. The anxiety is just, just eating at me. Um, finally the hurricane blows over and I finally get out of the house and I try to go for a walk, just, just trying to calm down. And, uh, you know, I just, I didn't, at that time, I didn't have the skill. And when I came back, my son and my wife had gotten into an argument and I instantly, I ended up throwing him out of the house the day after a hurricane, you know, the, the situation almost got physical. My wife had to break it up. It caused problems with her. And it was finally the point where I realized I need help. Yeah. You know, and I still, my pride was still there. So I still didn't go to the VA. Um, I used TRICARE and I found a, uh, a, a army buddy of mine that was seeing a, a civilian therapist or a civilian psychiatrist. And uh, I went to him. You know, and I didn't want to talk about things, but he at least got me on medication to where I was seeing, you know, I was st stable mm -hmm. and, and think through things, which kind of made things worse because now I can look around me and say, wow, what a hole I dug. Right. I should have never owned a business. I wasn't mentally stable to own a business. I'm now not financially stable anymore because my business is suffering, you know. My marriage and my relationship with my kids has become destroyed. I've lost all these years with my, my family. And now on top of it, the one person that I should love, I can't stand. And that's me. Right. You know, so, um, that was the beginning of the time that I, uh, um, started seeing help. And, uh, I got help for a few years from that, 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 uh, um, psychiatrist. He was an amazing guy. Um, he, uh, was never in the military, but, uh, he wrote a lot of books about PTSD and has done a lot of research about it. And, uh, he, uh, 
went through SEAL training, mm. just, just to experience it from a researcher's standpoint, just to see the training that people go through. Oh, wow. And, you know, it didn't take him long to relate to what I've gone through. When, when he looked at my DD-214 and then found out the unit I was in and how many deployments and how, how long I've, I've been deployed. And yeah, he, he knew instantly, you know, and, uh, he asked how come, uh, I didn't have anything about TBI, my records. And I, and I told him, I said, I've never been diagnosed with it, but you know, when he was performing the test on me, I failed a lot of the memory tests and I still have a lot of memory issues and stuff now. And he told me that, that he thought that I probably had TBI and we didn't understand why it wasn't caught. And I said, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why, because I didn't, when I got back, you know, you can't go see your family until you complete all these assessments. So you do what you do to get through the assessments so you can go home and see your family. That That's you, right. You know, and you get out of having to take it all. You do. You, you don't take it. You just move on. And you sure as hell tell a psychiatrist that there's any problems that you're seeing things because now you, you, you didn't get to see this, that you've seen the, the assistant that took that and the psychiatrist doesn't immediately until it's all over with. So now at the end of the day, you get to sit there and wait until he gets to talk to you. So now your families are the last ones sitting out there waiting for you to, to come out because you can't home the resources that it's safe for you to go home, but he doesn't start seeing anybody until all of the, the in process. So no, you're not going to say that you're nightmares or you're having any bad dreams or, or you had any explosions that happened close to you and you're having headaches and, and all these things, you know, you just want to go home. That's right. I mean, uh, I, I have the same experience. Um, when I came back from Afghanistan, um, just the paperwork, just to process me back into the country. Uh, they made me, uh, I, I came back separate from the rest of my unit just because of the circumstances uh, that were happening. I won't get into all that uh, right now, but um, I, I was on my own and they gave me like two or three days to finish all the paperwork. I think it was three days that I, I was supposed to have to finish all the paperwork. Um, I got it done in a day and I was like, okay, can I go home now? And they were like, I can't believe you got it done so quickly. You know, yep. it's crazy. So let's talk about your, your nonprofit and what you do now um, with the uh, Heroes Voices Media Foundation. Uh, what prompted you to start it? And, and tell us a little bit about it. So um, I kind of got to back up just a little bit to get you there. Um, so after 9-11, um, the business was, was struggling and, uh, my mom was getting to the point where, where she needed more attention. Um, she lived in Iowa and up to this point I had been taking, uh, loads to run me through Iowa so I could stop and help her do some honeydew lists. And then I'd go back out on the road, go back to Georgia, spend some time with the family. And this just became a cycle. Well, when COVID happened, those loads became very hard and did not pay very well. And I had just bought, you know, a, a new truck, um, another poor decision that should have never been made. And, uh, um, so I ended up deciding to close the business and, and go find a job. And this all happened again after I got help and started seeing things clearly. Um, so I, I put a, I put a little lifeline out there asking anybody, Hey, anybody out there that has been applying for jobs? Who do you go through? Because I never had one. I went from the army to owning my own business, so I've never worked for anybody but myself. And uh, my old first sergeant said, "Hey, if you're looking for a job," he said, "I got one for you here in Missouri." And so I I was struggling trying to figure out the logistics to get my mom to be able to move to Georgia because she lost so many benefits with her Medicaid because of the money that you're allowed to make and so forth. And so I took that job in Missouri. And uh, reunited with my old first aunt. And we started this podcast called Two Drunk Dudes in a Gun Room. And, uh, you know, 
it, there, there's two types of people. You're either on the side where you think that's funny and, and you like it, or you're on the other side where you think I'm promoting that veterans with mental illness should ha- go have a bunch of guns and a bunch of alcohol and you don't even look at the podcast. But the truth is my buddy owned a little gun business. And before we started the podcast, um, I spent a lot of time in his gun room with him, drinking a few beers or some bourbon and putting guns together and doing some hydro dipping and shooting. And that was our pastime. We enjoyed it. It was fun. And so out of the blue, when we we realized that the VA was not satisfying what we felt we needed to do for the veteran community, I was kind of joking, didn't know what I was saying, but it's kind of like the buzzword. So I said, Hey, why don't we start a podcast? And he goes, okay, well, what would it be called? And I laughed and said, well, why don't we just call it two drunk dudes in a gun room? And so season one, we literally filmed the whole season in his gun room. So, I mean, there's guns all over the place. There's reloaders, there's ammo everywhere, you know? And, uh, I think we're banned on for life on TikTok because of, (laughs) you know, guns in the background. Every time we tried to go live, it was just a matter of minutes and we were kicked off, you know? And it was usually for the same reason. There was a a shotgun over the the wall on the top that was mounted on the wall. It was a little uh, shockwave is all it was. And uh, it took us a couple bannings before we figured out that's why they were banning us because it was in the background. You could see it in the camera. But uh, um, so after season one, towards the end, he kind of dropped off the stories. You know, originally it was just to bring our soldiers back and put some camaraderie around us. And the stories were starting to get a little deeper and uh, the people that we were bringing on got a little bit more and, and he kind of, for personal reasons, kind of dropped off. And uh, so season two, because I'm not very good talking by myself without somebody to feed off of, I, uh, I started reaching out and having guests come on. And by this time, I had realized that podcasting is kind of a form of therapy. I mean, it, is. it gets you talking, um, especially. Does. You can get somebody around you and you can forget that it's being recorded. You can forget that it's live, whatever. And you're just having a conversation with another veteran and you just talk about things that happen. And I found myself opening up about stuff that I've never even talked to my family about. Yeah. And so I realized that and I got to that point where I didn't care if one person watched my show or 10,000 people watched it. It was about me healing at this point and it was work. Well, my Facebook um, algorithm somehow started putting veteran musicians and some people put me in contact with some. And I realized they had the same problem that podcasters have is, you know, Spotify, you're either a huge success from the get go or you get buried in the algorithms and you're going to spend a lot of money advertising. It's one or the other. And for me, it didn't matter because I had a job for them. This was their job. So Another just spontaneous idea. I said, well, why don't I just start a radio station and we'll just play veterans music and then they won't have no competition. And you either have to be a veteran or a dependent of a veteran. And if you're a musician or if you're just writing and singing songs in your bedroom and recording them, we play everybody's music. It doesn't matter. If you give it, if you give it to me, it's going on there. And I learned real quick that it wasn't that simple. Um, I had to turn it into a business so I could get licensed through BMI and ASCAP and, and those companies. And that led to my podcast getting sponsored by a, a nonprofit called, uh, um, operation encore. And so they paid for some of this licensing. And, uh, now that the radio station's up and running, we have three channels. We have uh, a country station called Simplify country. We have a, a rock station called Ranger rock wave. And we have, uh, a mix station called vet mix. And, uh, um, the only deciding factor is, is if we physically have enough music on a genre, I will create the station and it'll be its own station. Vent mix plays everybody, but we, we grew so fast. I couldn't believe it that I went from one artist on the day that we launched to now we're probably just under a hundred artists and six, 700, um, songs, you know? So it got to the point where people were only getting their songs played like once every three days because we had so many, you know, everybody's songs got played. It Mm -hmm. was no, you know, and this ran 24 hours a day. The first three months I played 18,000 songs 
And so um, I realized there was good stuff coming from this and I wanted to do a little bit more. So I, I, I started and, and it hasn't been officially um, put as a nonprofit. We're, we're, we're now applying for the 501c and, and uh, going through all the legality. But we started this foundation called uh, Heroes Voices Media Foundation. And there's three projects that are underneath it. There's uh, Military United Podcast Streams, which is for podcasters and streamers. You got the Gun Room Radio, which is for the musicians. And then we've got a project that I'm still writing that I haven't officially launched yet called uh, Warrior Words. And it's for authors, bloggers, and article writers, uh, poets, and, and that type of stuff. Each of these projects are designed to, one, allow you to keep doing what is therapy. You're either writing songs about stuff that are a story that you want to tell. You're, you're telling it on podcasting. You're writing it in a book. But all these things can get really frustrating if all you're doing is dumping money and you're not getting anything back out of it. Right. So our goal is to help you keep going until you can find some form of traditional therapy that works for you. Because so many people go to the VA, they walk out those doors and they say, well, there's nothing that works for me. And there is so many other things out there. But you have to keep these guys looking and trying things until they find it. And, and that's the purpose of it. Yeah. And, you know, there's, there's all these different ways of, um, you know, kind of alternative therapies. You were just talking about how podcasting to you would, became therapeutic. Mm -hmm. um, it's not stuff like if you go to a psychiatrist, it's not in their, their menu of things that they're going to offer to you. It's like, how do you start podcasting and, and give you that type of, uh, type of thing and say, here, go do this for a little while and see how it helps. Um, but there are things that you can do outside of a therapist's office that yeah. things like podcasting or writing or, or, uh, writing music or, artwork or any number of different things, gardening, ballroom yep. dancing, you know, whatever gets you out of your head for that minute. And in that present moment and just being focused on whatever it is that, it, that you find yourself doing that, that helps you. Like right now we're having this conversation and nothing else is in my mind except for this conversation. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, interested in your story I'm, I'm asking you about things that you did and and all that kind of stuff but um you know if i was just sitting here by myself in the same room with no other person on the other end of this this camera i know we're not physically sitting in the same room but we're still talking to each other as if we were um if i was sitting here by myself I'd, I'd have that opportunity to let my mind just kind of start wandering and going into places that maybe I don't want it to go to. And so no. this is very much therapy, you know, for anyone out there, you want to figure out a way to start talking to people without, without having to be in big crowds or, you know, whatever it started damn podcast, you know, like it's, it's too easy to, um, I, I can't say it's too easy. It, when I first started this thing, it was actually embarrassing because I didn't have a clue what I was doing as far as the technology side or any of that. Um, I, stu I, I stumbled my way through it. It was not pretty the first few episodes, but I, I got there. You know, I think I'm doing okay with, with what I got right now. But, um, but th this is great because all of these different um, you know, programs that you have to offer between the radio station and the podcasting and the um, – you know, the writers and all that kind of stuff. Um, they, they benefit these, these people, which has this, this effect where it's going to not only benefit them, but it'll benefit families. It'll benefit their, their careers and their other relationships and things like that too. So it's, while you, you may have one person who comes in, you're not helping one person. You're helping that whole network of people because right. that one person is getting better. Right. Yep. Absolutely. And, and so, this kind of led to another mission. So, you know, everybody always asks me, well, is that the, the big picture? Is it just to get people? And, you know, our podcast literally started about highlighting veterans. We didn't go into the mental health space. When we started this, we wanted 
there you could you could google you know podcast for P- veterans for ptsd and you will find a ho- there's enough to make their own little genre a whole chapter you know sure and uh you know I, it's not that i don't think i have anything to offer or or that uh you know there's not room for somebody to contribute but that's not my subject matter expert i mean i'm a you know what do they say i'm not just the president but i'm a member you know so <laughs> i don't i don't feel that i have that experience that knowledge to go in and say hey this is how you should cure it and how you deal with it but what i do know is just like any other veterans, you know, we are not the group of people that you put in a glass that says break in case of war. We have dreams and, and, and goals. And, and for some people that may be a lawyer that some, for some people that just may be to be retired and left alone and spend the rest of their life with their family. Um, for others, it may be that they put their, their music dreams on hold to serve their country first. And, and when they get out, they want to pursue to finish that dream. Yeah. But Think about this. If you were 40 years old and when you got out of the military after 15, 20 years, you know, do you think Sony Records is looking for you? I mean, there's not much time for them to make a lot of money off of you. Your music career is over. Your voice is starting to change. Your vocals are getting tougher, you know? And so the the likelihood that you're going to be the next Garth Brooks is is going to be very slim. Sure. And you add that to somebody that is using something that is their dream, that is also their therapy, and you crush all that at the same time. Now they're no longer doing any therapy. Their dreams have been crushed, probably pretty brutally, you know, because most times, they, you know, it's a business. It's not personal. They, it's not, they don't hate you. They just didn't like what you're doing. Mm-hmm. You know? And uh, that becomes even tougher because we don't even understand how the civilian world works when we walk out. So the big picture for us is that we want to partner with groups and we want to change a few things. We want a few categories that, you know, kind of focus on giving some time back to these veterans and putting some of these dreams together. And I've always wondered why there's not a, a, category for the top 100 veteran podcasters you know why is there not you know we got the cmas but why is there not the vmas right you know a lot of people don't know this i didn't know it until i had them on my show but did you know that there's a miss america veterans pageant i did actually i found I, that out i think I just earlier this year I, I found that out yeah and i you know i find that amazing and yeah. and you know, when you find out what it's really about, it becomes even more amazing, right? So the Miss America pageant is, you know, each of these contestants have their own platform that they're, you know, their own nonprofits they're working for, right? Mm-hmm. The whole pageant supports homeless veteran women with children because there isn't any shelters that will take women with children. They will take women but they're not set up to safely handle homeless children with their mothers. So they focus strictly on that. And it's a pageant that can get some attention. It's not about just beauty and, you know, you know, it's about you were a veteran, you know, and if you go to their website, it's so amazing. I don't know who the designer was, but I would love to shake their hand because it's got these, these women in dresses but it looks like they just low crawled through a, a, a mud pit, you know, <laughs> and it, it looked like soldiers, you know, but the yeah. feminine is still there. And it's amazing because you can have both. You can be a female and you can be a warrior. Yeah. You don't have to decide. And so I think that's amazing what they're doing. So I want the VMAs, you know, before, before I walk away from this and, and I turn it over and I just become part of an alumni and I let, board members handle the rest of it and i finally can sit back and say it's complete i want the veteran music awards i want one day where veterans who have made it already ha- are hosting it and these guys that are grinding and playing at vfws and and american legions and these little fairgrounds and in any bar that will have them you know um we can get there you know 
between my radio station and, and hopefully other people out there will start radio stations and, and, and start, you know, um, publicizing their music and we can get enough people to start voting to where we can have a day where we're inviting these guys to come and there's red carpet and there's the, the real media press there to, to highlight them and get interviews. And you got people like George Strait that's on the stage calling their names out and, and it means probably nothing in the big picture, but maybe it raises money for a category similar to like what Miss America did. It reunites veterans that, that went through hard times and were drafted or, or came in during uh, tough times and still made it and become amazing musicians and artists. And they worked their ass off. They earned every bit of it. And these upcoming artists that are working their butts off can see that. And we can, we can unite the veteran side of that. It's no longer about celebrity versus, you know, you didn't make yours. You have to earn yours. And we can bring that camaraderie back between veterans and uh, um, we can get the people to see that it's, it's, you know, maybe the guy that's getting that award ain't going to be the next Garth Brooks, but he was for that day. Yeah. yeah. You know, and that's, yeah. that's what. That, that, that's, that's such a huge uh, thing too. You know, I, I was, I was just thinking about the benefits that, you know, getting that, that, their name out there on the, the radio station and, and help with the podcast and the, the writing and all the, these kind of things. Um, I think that that's super awesome, but then you're taking it a step further with this, uh, the way, the way you just described it. Um, and yeah, if you can get some celebrity veteran, uh, you know, musicians who can, you know, host it or, you know, at least be, you know, a part of it in, in some way, um, and give these folks the, the red carpet treatment where they're now the, they're the stars and you have these other, other people there who are celebrating them and celebrating their work. And we can listen to their music and enjoy the songs that they put together. Um, because they're, they're, they're pouring their, their heart and soul into some of this music. Right. Um, I, I've, I've talked to other artists of, you know, from a variety of different mediums, so whether they're sculptors or painters or, you know, and you name it, like a variety of different artists. And a lot of times they, they feel like they, they can't just have a conversation like, like you and I are having right now and just say what it is that is on their mind or whatever, but they can put it into their artwork, whatever that artwork and music is a form of artwork too. And so that's, it's just a different it's form, right? Um, and so they, they poured that in all of the, the emotions, all the things that they had bottled up for all those years, they're putting it into their artwork and that allows them to, um, that allows them to express themselves and get that off their, their chest and, and uncork that bottle. Yeah. So it's, it's not, you know, like, like a can of soda that you've shaken up ready to explode it, it's now you know kind of settling down and they're able to do that and that just um you know and then everybody gets to listen to that and you, you sort of get to hear a piece of this person's life that you otherwise probably never would have been able to hear the person maybe wasn't able to just talk right? and, and so i think it's important uh to do stuff like this so that we can learn and understand what's going on with these people you know people sometimes they just feel like oh veterans are you know they got ptsd and oh we got to be hands off we can't talk to these people we can't you know let's stay away from that person they might be a little crazy or whatever but but it's not that it's just they have a an outlet to express themselves and sometimes they, that's all they need right yeah you know and and that's the other part of this i just want to change that stigma you yeah. know i don't want you know and and I'm learning this even more so too. I had a gentleman on my show. Uh, his name is Tim Hill. Uh, he's a, a British uh, Army uh, veteran. And uh, he spent time as an infantryman and then finished the rest of his career in the PSYOPs world. And I had the most amazing conversation with him. I really did. I don't know if you've ever had him on your show. No. no. But uh, he, uh, he woke me up to something I never thought about. You know, Have you ever sat there and thought about I wonder if our allies that fought, you know, cause I mean, I, I served 
with some Russian troops. I served with some Canadian troops. I've served with some British troops. Um, I've ate chow with some French guys. They are just as stuck up as you'd believe. But uh, <laughs> they were pilots. In their defense, our pilots are pretty stuck up. Here. I mean, I think I don't think it matters what what flag is on their uniform if they're if they're a pilot, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. just kidding. No, it, it's true. So, <laughs> but uh, um, the, 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 I, but I never really sat back and wondered. You know, I wonder how the war affected their soldiers. Right? Did they ever go through PTSD? Are are, are do they have a twenty two a day? You know. And when I talked to him, he made a statement in there and it just hit me like a brick, you know, uh, when he was talking about his podcast and the mental health he's doing because so many of his buddies are killing themselves. And I said, wow, it's not an American soldier thing. That's a, that's a soldier thing. Yeah. You know, and, and then you can take it a step further. If, if you can get through your anger, you know, I still struggle with this part of it, but you can look at, you know, our enemies and. And if you can separate the, the government stuff and, and uh, the anger that you may carry for something that happened to somebody or even something to yourself and ask yourself, that person that was on the other side of that, um, were they just a soldier and doing a job like you were? Or were they just really evil? You know. And when you start asking those questions, man, then you have to ask yourself, what mental health situation were they in? And that, that rabbit hole can get pretty deep when you, when you open it up and you start really asking yourself, was any of this worth it? It's, that's a tough, tough question. It's a tough, um, and it's a tough way to look at it too, because, you know, when you are training and this is, this is stuff that has happened for years and years, this is not unique to, you know, current conflicts or more recent conflicts. Um, when you're training, you're training to fight an enemy, uh, a faceless, a nameless enemy. You, a lot of times what? people would give, give nicknames to the enemy just to dehumanize, humanize them, um, to, to make them seem less human. So it's easier to kill them. You know, if you think of it, that person as a, just a inanimate object or as just an animal or something like that, it's much easier to kill than it is another human. That's why they're you know, they had nicknames like Krauts and, you know, back in World War II or, and stuff like that for the Germans. And, you know, they had all these different names going all throughout time and it just dehumanizes people. And it's a, it's a very effective way to just not think of that person that you're about to pull the triggering and blow their brains out. It's a very uh, effective way to just think of them as just another target, you know, that's, yep. There's another pop-up target on the range that, you know, one of the... Why we don't use circle bullseyes for qualification. We use black silhouettes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And that, that's, that's what we were trained to do and are trained our mind to do. So I don't care what that person's family life is like. I didn't nope. care what that, that person, you know, was that person have a good day? Were they, were they feeling depressed today? I don't really care. They got a gun. They're pointing it in my direction. I'm going to pull the trigger. And I, you know, and I'm going to end them, um, you know, and that's, that's the, the thought process. Um, it's actually pretty amazing that, uh, what was it back in world war? I think it was world war one when, um, on Christmas day, they, they, the two sides stopped fighting and they went out and they, they, they met in, in the middle of the battlefield and, you know, they played soccer, they sang songs, they shared, uh, you know, food and drinks and cigarettes and all that kind of stuff. They, they came together and they actually treat each other as human um the thing to me that is the most crazy about this whole situation is that then they went back to their foxholes and they they went back down and the next day they were shooting at each other again how how do you turn that on and off that quickly like one day i, I would have been like oh, that's a guy i i was playing soccer with and singing songs with and that that's how could i do that you know but that's what they did it just i don't know it's it's uh crazy to think about um anyways um we're i think maybe going down a bit of a rabbit hole with that but that's okay um so you're you talked a little bit about your podcast the two drunk dudes in the gun room which i think uh you said people take it one one of two ways and uh i think when you introduce that um 
my laughter probably indicated which way I, I was taking it. Um, but it, I, I could see it. Like it either sounds like a really bad idea uh, to, to some people or a ton of fun to other people. And so, um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, so, um, so the podcast, you, you said you, you now have, have uh, interviews with people and, and talk about, uh, you know, various things. Uh, what, what kind of topics do you discuss and what can people expect when they uh, check out the show? So, you know, up to probably halfway through season two, um, it was all about 501Cs and veteran stuff. It was the veteran community and 501Cs. And, uh, you know, I think part of that was because I was healing and I was looking for things. And now that I've kind of gotten to that point, because like I said, I established, you know, this podcast, when you, when you watch my show, you're getting me, you know, when I walk away from this, the same guy that walks away is the same guy, because I really don't care if, if one person watches or 10,000 people watch, Sure. um, you know, I enjoy doing it and it's, it's fun. And so now that I have now expanding myself, um, there's a few things that I'm still searching for. I am, my goal is to get off the medication that I'm, I'm slowly working my way towards that. I have joined a group therapy, um, and I'm going to throw a plug out there for them. It's called the Warrior's Way Mindset, uh, an amazing program. It's not a nonprofit. They're a for-business um, program, but it has done an amazing job for me. And uh, if you're not a uh, sit on the couch and talk to the VA counselor who's looking at their watch and Telling you that when you're really, really upset, you should sit down and write down why you're upset at that moment while it's fresh in your mind. And I'm like, well, then I would have to put him down because I'm trying to punch him and I can't write in paper and punch him at the same time, you know, and they just don't understand the humor in that. But, uh, right. um, you know, this is a, this, and, and it's the other disclaimer too. They're also for men. They, they don't, they don't have any, uh, there's fe there's female help out there that they can direct you to, but that particular one is is for males. But uh, um, they are they're an amazing organization, and and they have helped me get to that point now where I feel comfortable saying I think this time I can wean myself off this medication. Um, I have trained myself to to deal with some things, mm -hmm. and I think I'm okay and then now. Feel bad days and good days and not just that straight line of you know the same guy yeah. so um on my podcast i do still kind of search out things like psychedelics and alternative uh therapy but for the most part um if i find somebody that's just got a really cool story i don't care if they're a veteran anymore or or what they do um i invite them on to hear their story um I, I'm getting ready to release an episode with a, a lady named uh, Amanda Blackwood. Um, and I learned a whole bunch about human trafficking and what um, what human trafficking really is, not the buzzword social media news flash catch your eye term human trafficking. And uh, I think uh, that type of stuff where you get real talk and, and real conversations where you're learning things from people without an agenda is an amazing. Um, and, and I also still get a lot of people that hit me up and they, they just have products that they want to sell. Um, so I, you know, I will throw this out there too, just because it's starting to happen a lot lately. Um, I am not a influencer. I'm not a, a supporter of, uh, any particular thing. Um, I got duped once to where I thought we were going to talk about something else and it turned out to be a uh, pyramid type scheme. Um, so I quit live streaming my, my shows so that I can now um, record them and have the option to say, nice try. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, I, if, if you do have something that you're trying to, to get to the, to the veteran community and you, you want me to tell them about it and it's a product, you better be prepared to send it to me and let me try it, let me research it, and let me determine whether or not the intent is to help people or is the intent to get to their their wallets. Because I will not produce a product that is is or, or endorse something that's questionable sure. and right. just going to make money. 
So if that's what you're looking for, when you reach out to me, you, you probably found the wrong guy. But if you have a, a nonprofit, uh, if you have a, uh, just an amazing story, whether it be funny or, or not, um, you know, I will, uh, I will gladly have you on because I've had, I've reached out to people that do, uh, their therapy is fire walking and that just sounds amazingly crazy to me, but Hey, I would love to hear about it. So, sure. you know, um, I, I came, I got invited to be on a podcast that turned into a connection that I'm, I'm hoping, um, comes through a guy, uh, Jimmy Hendrix's cousin, uh, Reggie Hendrix is doing a tribute to Jimmy Hendrix and singing one of his albums. And the tour dates all seem to be pretty much on military installations. So I am trying to get him to come on the show because I just think that's amazing. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the type of people I have. It's just, you know, um, I kind of feel th similar to like what Joe Rogan does, man. It just, if it's a conversation worth having and something to talk about, cause it sounds really cool or, or interesting, you know, I'm, I'm into some of these crazy things like, you know, uh, spirits and ghosts and is there aliens, you know, um, stem cell research, you know, why do we not do it in, in the United States, you know, uh, hacking, you know, all these just social questions. I kind of relate my podcast as, you know, you're standing around waiting for formation to start and then the, the what if topics and the, just the, you know, what would you do for a million dollars type questions start coming up and those conversations just start. And that's kind of what my podcast is. You know, it's just conversations that we're going to have. I don't never know where it's going to go. Um, right. But uh, I do, I do similar like you, I give an agenda and that's just a guideline. So, you know, I will still get to the point if you do have a website or if you do have something that you're trying to promote a, a nonprofit, we're going to make sure that we get that done. But uh, I'm, I'm about the story, you know, and uh, part of that is, is, is I love telling this story. Uh, it was in towards the end of my military career. And, uh, some of the, some of the army stories, man, you just can't make them up. It's impossible. <laughs> but, uh, I had a commander that was, uh, in trouble. So his punishment by the battalion commander was he had to interview all of his lower enlisted and then report back to him what he learned about them. Well, I had this one soldier. I don't mind sharing his name. Uh, his name was private Thompson. And, uh, the day I met him, he walked up to me and he said, Sar, uh, I don't like the army. Can you chapter me? That was my introduction to him. Wow. wow. He introduced himself to the first sergeant the same way. And that's pretty much all he wanted was out of the army. So when it was Private Thompson's turn to be interviewed, I walked up there, sat down. Commander looked at him and said, Private Thompson, why did you join the army? He did not flinch, did not even hesitate. All he said was, call of duty, sir. And uh, the commander goes, I get that. He said, you probably had family members that, that joined and, and you probably felt that sense of urgency for your country. And this kid had the dumbest look on his face. And he looked at me and I looked at him and I said, sir, I'm pretty sure he's talking about the video game. <laughs> and he goes, Yes, sir. I was thinking it was like Call of Duty, but it's not. Can you chapter me? And he looked at me. The commander looked at me and I said, you invited him up here, sir. <laughs> and he said, well, Private Thompson, you're dismissed. Wow, and the interview wow. was over. <laughs> wow. wow. Yeah, I guess there's not too many latrines that need to be mopped in, uh, in Call of Duty, you know? No. <laughs> or or any other stupid details that you might have to do, like pulling the weeds out of the lawn or whatever. I don't know. But for anybody that was worried about Private Thompson, he finally got his wish. We, we did chapter him. He, he is happily living somewhere in the United States. You know, there was no harm done to any Private Thompsons on this episode. So <laughs> that's <laughs> funny. It's funny. Um, so for the listeners who maybe are interested in what, Heroes, Heroes Voices Media Foundation is going to uh, be able to offer as far as maybe they're, they're musicians, they, they want to get their music out there, or they have podcasts that they need help with, or um, 
you know, writing and any, anything like that, uh, where can they go to find out more information about uh, what you're doing and uh, how they can get involved with that? So the easiest way I have, I have made all my websites kind of linked together. So if you go to the podcast website, which is easiest usually for people to remember is, is two drunk dudes in a gun Um, and you can go there. You can also, there'll be links to get you to any of the other websites. Um, but the, the nonprofit is, uh, heroes voice media foundation, uh, dot org. And then there's also each of the projects have their own page. Um, so you got military united podcast streams dot org and then you've got gunroomradio.com for the radio station and then like i said we haven't launched the uh the one for the authors yet but it'll, it'll be warriorswords.com or dot org when uh, it comes out okay and okay. uh you, you can go to any of those and and reach us you can reach me via my email it's d done at two drunk dudes in a gun room dot beer not dot com so um you can reach me through that way or, or just my name, Donald Dunn at gunroomradio.com. Um, either way. And, uh, you can reach me out and, uh, you know, there's no requirements to, uh, um, as far as, uh, you know, we may ask you some questions just to verify you were military or a dependent, um, just general topics. You know, there's no, we don't have anything system set up to where you have to show DD two fourteens or any personal information to prove you're a veteran. Um, you know, we just, if you're using stolen value or we just hope that you have explosive diarrhea in a traffic jam all day, but uh, for the most part, you know, um, that's all it takes. And then, you know, the only thing you have to do on your part is to send me a bio uh, picture to put up on our website. Um, we have a little video clip of your, your picture with a link. Um, with your bio and it'll link them back to your Spotify or, or wherever you're posting your music. So people can get one, it gets you a little bit more recognition. People can get other tastes of your music and uh, then send me the, uh, the songs that you want on the station in an MP3 format. And uh, that's it. That's, and we will upload it and I will promote the hell out of it. I will put it all over social media with welcome sites. I will tag you and, your, your music page and, and everything in it. Um, I will set it up to get you on my podcast to, to get you out there and known as an artist, not just a veteran. Um, we can set it up for you to do, uh, call in, um, radio talk, um, whatever you need. If you've got a song that's coming out and you want some extra publicity, you know, None of this, you don't have to pay for any. There's nothing, there's no charges. There's no membership fees. The listeners can, can download uh, Two Drunk Dudes in a Gun Room app on uh, Apple or on uh, um, Google Android, yeah. and get to uh, um, the radio station that way. Um, I have tried to get Gun Room Radio its own app under its own name. It, you can find it on Android. Me and Apple are having disagreements, but uh, um, not over the name. Their their disagreements is uh, the the coding that was done on it. So I, I was actually I, thinking that it was probably something to do with the name that they they just objected to the fact that you're using gun in the name or oh, whatever. But no, I I took a shortcut and tried to use a no code site to to build it, and and they're they're objecting the the that using a third party i guess they don't want people using third party coding up and loaded under their development account so now i have to take the time and actually go code it myself and and do it i was just trying to take the shortcut but sure. it'll it, i mean i just haven't had time and there is one other thing that is coming that i forgot to mention um so here and hopefully about two to three weeks we'll have a uh, tv channel starting as well for uh it'll be on roku at first and then uh it'll move over into Apple TV as well. Uh, but it's going to, we're going to have two channels. One is going to be for the podcasters. And then we're also, if you remember MTV and you're old like me and you just enjoyed having fun watching music videos without yeah. all the yeah. other stuff, we're going to have what's called MMTV military music television. Oh, awesome. so 
and all these artists that already have, you can go on YouTube, you can go to gunroomradio.com and click on MMTV. And I have a list of links, their YouTube links to all these music videos that these artists have paid all the way up to like $8,000 to have uh, directed and promoted. And, and they're giving them out for free just to get their music out. That's how much these guys are passionate about this stuff, you know? And uh, they don't want to be known as like my music because I'm a veteran. They want you to like their music because you like their music or that it reached you in a way. They're an artist, no different than, than you know, Garth Brooks or anybody else. They, they, at the end of the day, an artist really just wants you to like their art. And if you don't, they want you to go like another artist that you can relate to. They're not upset about that. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, I'm not a country guy. And I work with a lot of country people and they're, you know, sometimes I have to tell them, yeah, it sounds pretty good. I'm just not a country guy, you know, sure. but we'll play it. I love rock and roll. I love the eighties, nineties metal, the older metal, you know? And so I relate personally to some of the other artists that are on there. You know, I listen to Ranger rock wave. I don't listen to simplify country as much, but that's the personal choices. And, and, you know, some of these artists forget that, you know, being an artist is also about being who you are. You yeah. are yeah. a veteran. That is part of who you are. You're not using a cheat code. It's not A, A, B, B, start, select, left, right, left, right. And now you're an artist because you're a veteran and that was your cheat code. Right. That's who you are. Um, so you have to accept some of that too. Um, that, you know, people are going to come to you and, and having your own platform that's for veterans and not for other people is, isn't no different than being able to cheat the system with, with Spotify because you have $10,000 advertisement budgets, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so you use what you have. If it's money, if it's a story, if it's passion, whatever. You, you, that's what's in your life. And so all of these things are coming. Um, the Roku channel, the Apple TV, the, the, the apps are are out there um any of those websites will link you to any of the other websites any of those names that i just mentioned heroes voices uh military united uh two drunk dudes in a gun room all those are on facebook and any of the social medias under their names uh my personal podcast page is not two drunk dudes in a gun room it's donald dunn um and i did that because i had you know just under what eight or nine thousand followers on on face facebook so i donated my two drunk dudes in a gun room page to the military united podcast streams page and we changed the name to to match that so if you if you look for two drunk dudes in a gun room you won't find it i i combined it and two drunk dudes in a gun room is a podcast that is under military united podcast streams okay. um, so i'm no different than any of the other guys i'm a veteran artist veteran content creator and my podcast fits underneath them i don't have any other special benefits if you want to be a part of building this um i've made it really super easy um my podcast is is kind of promoting it and uh we need to raise eighteen hundred dollars to to cover all the lawyer fees and the money to get the 501c going and everything um everything right now i pay for everything you know um i put money in the bank every two weeks to go towards those lawyer fees. I pay for all the airtime for all the radio stations. I pay for all the podcasting stuff. I pay for all the website stuff, you know? Um, and I do it because I love it. I don't do it because I expect to get money or anything. However, with things growing, um, you know, just to give people an idea of, of what things cost, it's going to run me a hundred dollars a month just for the TV channels. It's going to, you know, it runs me thirty nine ninety five a month for, per radio station for the radio stations. Um, it runs me $400 a year for all the website hostings, you know, and you know, as well as I do what podcasts cost you. So, you know, I do it because this is my, this is my extracurricular, you know, mm -hmm. I go to work, I come home and I work on this. That's my life. I don't do anything else. Right. Um, so. I did create um, on my page what's called the on the two drunk dudes in a gun room dot com page the wall of fame. If you go to that, um, 
there's several different options you can donate uh, money to. If you're a business and you want some airtime and you want to cover a year's worth of airtime at $39.95 a month um, for a radio station, that's what it'll cost you to advertise for a year on those on that radio station is $39.95 a month. You know, I'm not making anything off of it. You are covering the cost for these veterans to get played. In return, you're going to get played several times throughout the day during the, the rush hour time for your advertisements. You know, you will be the only one that is on there being advertised. So you're not going to be competing with anybody. If there's another radio station out there that can offer you a better deal, let me know. I want to advertise too. <laughs> you know, sure. so, um, but those are the things that help, you yeah. know, if you want your name on the wall, um, as the wall of fame, what that's going to be is once we get to the $1,800 mark, I'm going to take that page down and I'm going to have a plaque built that looks like a wall with all those names on it. And it will be kept with heroes, uh, heroes voice media foundation as the foundation building of this wall because you were those are the names that helped us and sure. and show you the dedication if you go to that wall i paid ten dollars on top of the hundred dollars every two weeks that i donate to to getting this done for my dog to be a part of building this and if you look on the wall there's a name that says little ann and she helped she paid her ten dollars to be on that wall to to help That's be a part awful. you know um anybody that has bought a hat uh, bought any memorabilia in the past, their name's on that wall. Um, I, there, nobody gets paid from this. None of my board, there's no, no, no people that work with me. Um, my graphic designer is not part of, of this. She has a business and I pay for the graphic designing. Um, you know, she, she gives me a super heck of a deal and I promote the hell out of her in return because she charges me $25, uh, a month to manage the website and she charges me a hundred dollars to build the website. Um, oh, wow. That, that so, is a smoking deal. If you can't you can find that. someone to do that, like for that price. And, you know, assuming it's good work too, which, you know, I've taken a look at this, the site yeah. and everything. It's, you know, it's not like you, you just got some, you know, someone who's hacking their way around. who doesn't know what they're doing. Right. But they, you got, you got a smoking deal on that one. So, um, and that's her college degree. I mean, that's, that's what she does. She's done all my low, um, she charges me $50 for a logo and she's done 90% of all my logos. Um, she's designing, um, the season three covers for each of the episodes, okay. you know? So, and she's a veteran of mine. She was a soldier of mine. Oh, you know? okay. that's so, awesome. keeping it, keeping it in the family, right? Yep. So, so awesome. Well, so I'll have all those links in the show notes for folks to go check out. Um, if you are an artist um, in any of those, uh, you know, forms and you want to get your, your stuff out there, um, you know, definitely check that out. Um, if you want to make a donation to help fund this project and, um, you know, anything like that, check out the website again and, and you can do that. You'll be part of, uh, part of this. Um, you know, eighteen hundred dollars uh, is is the goal. I'm sure we get a few people putting some put a little bit of money together. We we can get there pretty quick. So, um, so even if you think it's not that much, um, you know, it's you know only, only a few bucks. It's probably not going to help. Well, it'll help. You know, because it all adds sure. up. And so, so definitely go go check it out and um, you know do what you can to to help out this this project. When things go sideways, will you be prepared? Some people are concerned they might have to go for a long time without electricity or even food. That's why I want to introduce you to 4 Get preparedness products you can use now and that could save your life later. My favorite is 4Patriots new solar generator, the Patriot Power Generator 2000X. It uses the endless free power of the sun to power lights, your TV, medical equipment, even run your fridge. Plus it's expandable and comes with a free solar panel. Or pick up one of 4Patriots' best-selling survival food kits. Delicious tasting and designed to last for 25 years. They even have kits with real meat. And if the power's out, no worries. Just boil water over a fire, simmer, and serve. You'll enjoy a hot meal and stay safe in a crisis. 
More smart people than ever are finding Poor Patriots. Over 2 million customers trust them. You might have even seen them on TV. I had the folks at Four Patriots set up a special page for you at fourpatriots.com forward slash drive on so that listeners of this podcast can see this week's discounts and deals before they go away. Go to fourpatriots.com forward slash drive on, but hurry, these deals won't last long. Save more and get peace of mind now by going to fourpatriots.com forward slash drive on. Before we wrap up this episode, um, I, I want to do a segment uh, on this, this show uh, that I like to call, Is It Service Connected? Um, and kind of a little bit of way to end the episode with a little bit of humor. Um, for the viewers who are maybe not familiar, uh, who haven't been tuning into the last few episodes or the, or the last few months here, um, Is It Service Connected is sort of like America's Funniest Home Videos uh, military edition where we Take a look at a video of a service member doing something stupid, and then we, first off, we laugh about it because you know, it's funny. Uh, <laughs> but uh, then we then we try to we joke about whether or not the VA would uh, cover that for disability somewhere down the line if it's service connected, where the name for the segment comes from. So um, for the podcast listeners who can't view the screen um, because you listen to the audio only version, I'll try to describe it as best I can, but. Uh, definitely go check out the show on YouTube and Twitter and everywhere else that the uh, the video gets posted. Um, so with that, I'm going to pull up this video here. And um, oops, screen's been a little funky for me here. All right, so I got the video here. Um, right now for the listeners who can't view this, looks like there's a soldier probably downrange somewhere, really sandy. Yep. You know, in the area he's riding a bike though and um i don't know let's let's see how this goes it's probably not gonna end probably not gonna end the way he thought it was going to end uh at the beginning of it but we'll see he's riding the bike he's going pick up some speed doing a jump and eats it he's face first in the dirt <laughs> um yeah he he uh did not do as well as he thought he was going to do with that i, I don't think um that was that, that was him trying to show off Pro probably back in the day he was able to do some jumps but you know like anything we get a little bit older and we're not quite as good as we, as we what's that song I'm, I'm not as good as i once was but yep yep <laughs> he's not <laughs> <laughs> um so anyways um yeah i'm, I'm thinking I think he probably ended up okay on uh, after that. He maybe maybe uh, got his clock wrong a little bit. But I think he'll be okay. I don't, I don't think there's anything too serious uh, going on with that. Probably been a little better if he had a helmet of some sort on. <laughs> he'll protect his head as he got a mouthful of dirt. But other than that, I think he'll be okay. Yep. I, I definitely don't think. Just so you know, the VA is not going to cover that. He he wasn't wearing any headgear. So. Yeah, that that was. I think that was on him. That was his fault for doing, <laughs> doing that. And uh, I don't know if I don't know if I've ever seen uh, you know the the bike being authorized uh, you know as a mode of transportation for for military service. So I don't know. I was never if issued I, a bike. <laughs> if I had to guess that, that looked more like it was a, a moderner version of uh, Tent City there in uh, Kuwait. That's what it looked like. Yeah. That. that I kind of got that sense too. It, it did have that that feel to it. Um, yep. With the dust everywhere. You and never get that out of any vehicle parked. All those all those vehicles lined up. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyways, thank you again for taking the time to join us. I, I appreciate you sharing your your stories and everything that you're doing now to help out other veterans and and their their uh you know dependents and everything like that because um without people like you the these folks um would be struggling to do it on their own and like we got done saying earlier uh, you know you can't really do it all on your own and, and just isolate but, yourself and and try to figure these things up you know it you know it really does take a team of people to come together put their minds together and figure out how, how are we going to do this and once you got that that platform set up now it's just feeding the the new songs, the new music, you know, everything like that, feeding it into there and it, it's getting that exposure. And, and, you know, one of these days, uh, you know, some of these people are going to, going to maybe see some benefits from that and, and get, 
get their their work out there. Maybe it'll pay off monetarily, but maybe maybe not. And but maybe it'll maybe it'll pay off in getting their message heard and getting their songs heard and, and things like that. And and yeah. I think that's what most of, most of these people are looking for, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and one other thing too, if if people or anybody's out there that's that wants to give it a shot, we are looking for DJs for the radio stations. Oh, awesome. Okay. If well, anybody, you know, have them reach out to me, and I will show them how they do it, and they can pick what show, what channel, and and what time frames they want to do it. All I ask is that you play the music that is on there and how you can promote. If you're a podcast, you can promote your podcast. I don't care. Just make sure you're playing the veterans music and uh, that it doesn't become a three hour talk show and none of the veterans are getting any exposure. That's all I ask. That's awesome. All right. Well, again, for the listeners, the links will be in the show notes. Uh, check it out if you're interested. And uh, Donald, thank you again for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the Drive On Podcast. If you want to support the show, please check out Scott's book, Surviving Son, on Amazon. All of the sales from that book go directly back into this podcast and work to help veterans in need. You can also follow the Drive On Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and wherever you listen to podcasts.